All right, let's take our Bibles tonight. Psalm 106, please. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. And then when you found your place, let's stand together. Yeah, it's not even summer yet and it's humid, isn't it? All right, found it, all good. Psalm 106, all right, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 7. Verse number 7, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And, you know, it's sort of a bit of an answer for those who think it was a reed sea. Yes, amen. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a reed sea, it was a wilderness. It was completely dried up. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, they sang praises. Now, here's the text for the message. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness unto or into their soul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, it has been prayed, we're just few in number, but God, we still want to hear from you tonight and ask God that you'd speak to us and Lord, that you would use me for your glory's sake and challenge us tonight with this thought. Father, help us to understand you in a a greater way, in a more perfect manner, if we could say it that way. And so God, I pray that you'd fill us all with your spirit. You know, the listener needs to be spirit filled as much as what the preacher does. And so, God, fill us tonight. Fill this place with your presence. God, may we hear from you and may we leave tonight knowing that we've heard from God. It's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to preach a message titled, Lest We Forget. Lest We Forget. Now, more often than not, we use that phrase or we've heard that phrase around Anzac time. And we go through that poem and then at the end of the poem that's read or that ode that is said, at the end it's lest we forget. Or we might hear it quoted and said at some other important time of the year in regards to a military endeavour like the Battle of Long Tan or some other thing like D-Day or Remembrance Day and the poem is read or the ode is read and then at the end it's lest we forget. Now, they say that because... The military or governments don't want us to forget what the soldiers on the battlefield have done. They don't want us to forget their feats. They don't want us to forget their works. They want us to remember that, to be always reminded of that for the sacrifice that people have made. I find it amazing, and I probably shouldn't because the folks here that we read about, the Jewish people, the Israelites, are no different from us. No different from us. Now, we might give them a hard time and think, you know what, And we're all fickle. How soon do we forget the works of God? How soon do we forget later on down the track where we forget that God delivered us perhaps uh, from a financial need? He's done it before and down the track we start worrying and carrying on and we start sweating and shaking and say, oh God, hang on a second, how soon we forget? Just like the children of Israel soon forget his works, we're like that too. Mm -hmm. But do you know that God doesn't want us to forget his works? As a matter of fact, as we read, it's interesting, look at verse number 8, it says, nevertheless he saved them for his name's sake. In other words, God had, you know God has a reputation to uphold? God has a reputation of doing the miraculous from doing the mighty. And look what he says here, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Do you know God still wants to make his mighty power to be known? Amen. 
But you know, the problem is, is that we're not seeing his mighty power because we have forgotten his works and uh, we go off and do our own thing and, or we don't believe in the, in the same God, the God of the Old Testament, who's the God of the New Testament, is the God of 2016 going on into 2017. He's the same God. And God still today wants to make known his mighty power. He wants us to remember his works. Now, not work. I mean, we could, if it was work, we could probably say, well, he wants us to remember his work of salvation. Now, we Baptists are comfortable with that work. But that's not the only work out of his works that God does. Do you know that God still does a delivering work? Amen. Do you know that God can still deliver the drug addict today by his mighty power? Do you know that God can still heal the sick person by his mighty power? Do you know that God can still raise... Look, I was going to say, I'm going to say, I do believe he could still raise the dead if he wanted to. Amen. He's not changed. But he wants to make his mighty power known and the works that he wants us to remember... In the message, when we get there, there is a domino effect that happens when we forget his mighty works. But before we get there, I want you to understand something about the word lest. Lest. I looked it up. In the Oxford Dictionary, it says this. It's a negative particle of intention or purpose introducing a clause expressive of something to be prevented or guarded against. So God is saying here, when he says, you forgot my works, and in other places, and we're going to go to a verse of scripture in a minute, he tells us not to forget his works, lest you forget my works. In other words, he's saying, you need to guard yourself against forgetting my miraculous works. We need to remember the works of God. We praise the Lord for the visitors here today. But do you know that they're here because of the mighty works of God? That's right. God brought them. We door knocked, but God brought them. God was the one that did the work. Anything that God does in our midst, anything that God does for you, He did it. I mean, that's pretty deep, isn't it? I mean, when God does the miraculous, it's like that's God doing His works. Do you know why I think a lot of Christians perhaps are miserable today and more often than not, maybe in our own circles, is we've forgotten His mighty works. We don't talk about His mighty works anymore. We don't talk about what God has done and what God can do. I wrote this down and I want you to remember this. Our responsibility is not just to remember what he has done, but what he can do. Because what he has done, he can still do. Amen. He hasn't changed. Do you know there's some meetings going on next week? We, uh, there's meetings going on in South Australia and there's meetings going on in Western Australia. I will almost bet my house, because it's not mine, but I'll bet my house... That in those meetings, no one will be talking about the mighty works of God. Mm-hmm. Oh, there may be someone that might say, well, you know, uh, thank God for salvation. And we do thank the Lord for salvation. Uh, praise God for that. But that's not the only work out of his works that he does. And so all these preachers are going to be getting together and they're going to be fellowshipping. But I, I doubt very much. You say, how do you know that? Because I've been in those meetings and no one talks about the mighty works of God. We are afraid as Baptist people to talk about any other work except about his saving work. Right. Now, we went to the meetings last night. I was encouraged by that. Brother Tony Evans got up and in his message and in his introduction of the ministry, do you know what he spoke about? The mighty works of God. He told us about a God that could provide thousands of dollars. He told us about a God that could supernaturally provide buildings for for him and his church in a seemingly very difficult situation. He told us about a God that could provide uh, 100 chairs instead of for $1,000 a chair, $100. Wasn't it $100 for one chair or $100 for all of them or something like that? $100 $100 for a chair. Instead of $1,000 for a chair, it was $100. Now, only God can do that. So last night, 
I was encouraged because I was reminded about the mighty works of God. And that's what, that's what remembering and rehearsing and telling people about his mighty works should do. It should encourage us. It should make us excited. It should get us up. It should make us happy. It should make us joyful. Remembering and rehearsing the mighty works of God gives us that pep in our step for when we start the week. Amen. And we've got to remember that. Carly said an amen. That's her one amen. That's her one amen. Now, Rudyard Kipling. Who's heard of Rudyard Kipling? Anyone heard of Rudyard Kipling? He is a well-known poet, but obviously not that well-known amongst some of us here. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called Recessional. I'm going to quote a couple of verses. God of our fathers, known of old... Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold, dominion over palm and pine, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart, still stands thine ancient sacrifice and humble and contrite heart, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget." It is reported that Rudyard Kipling put that phrase, lest we forget, in that poem because in his Bible reading, he came across a very important verse. And I want us to turn to that and hold your place there in Psalm. And I'd like for you to go to the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6 and verse number 12, we will see why Rudyard Kipling put that phrase, lest we forget, in his poem. He read this verse... And I'm going to read it to you right now. Verse number 12. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So Rudyard Kipling, when he wrote that poem, Recessional, he put in there that phrase, lest we forget, because in his Bible reading, he come across this verse and saw that God gave a, 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 a beware to his people and said, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out of the land of bondage. So in other words, God says this, I don't want you to forget my miraculous, mighty, powerful works that I've done in your Amen. life. Always remember those works. Amen. We remember them. How do we remember them? We've got a book, a Bible, that is filled with the recorded acts of God himself. But if we didn't have a record of the works of God here, then we could have the works that God does in our life personally. But maybe we don't talk about the mighty works of God anymore or we've forgotten them because we don't know them or because we've never experienced that in our life. And if we're not willing to step out by faith and be used of God and for God to work through us, then we're not going to experience His mighty works in our life. And do you know why He wants to do mighty works? Not only to make His power known, but because He wants to be praised for those works that He does. I, I want you to go back a few pages to Psalm number 78. Psalm number 78. And I want to read a few verses here. And I want to take the time to read this because remembering His mighty works ought to encourage us in the day that we live. You see, God is not dead. No. God is still alive. He's still on the throne. He can still do the miraculous. He can still do the mighty. I think one problem is we've just forgotten it and we don't believe it anymore. That's just my opinion. And you may differ from that. But when was the last time we saw the mighty works of God in our personal life? The miraculous, powerful works that God is known for his doings. In Psalm 78, verse number four, the Bible says this. We will not hide them. Now, this is talking about the parables. This is talking about what God has done. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Do you know that it is our responsibility as parents, as adults, to rehearse in the ears of the next generation the mighty works of God. 
Because if we don't tell the next generation and then the next generation, there's going to be a generation, and I'm not sure whether they're, we're there right now, where we have a generation of people that just do not know about the mighty works of God. Or they might say, well, you know, we've got it in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Bible, but such and such a preacher said this, that those things were confined to the Old Testament, or those things were confined to the prophets, or those things were confined to uh, the Gospels, or those things were confined to Jesus. And so therefore we have generations of Christians today who think that what God did yesterday, he can no longer do today because it's not the right time. Well, I differ on that. I believe that what God did yesterday, he can do today. As a matter of fact, when you read through the book of Revelation, you can't help but think that God is a mighty, powerful God. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is powerful because he is God. Now, if Jesus or God himself did it in the Old Testament and Jesus did it in the New Testament and Jesus is doing it in the millennial reign and in the book of the Revelation, why doesn't he do it in the church age? Hallelujah. He can. He can. We just have forgotten how soon we forget, but lest we forget. The Bible says this in Psalm 107, verse number 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Can I, can I say something? When Brother Jerome shared about his siblings getting saved this morning, this place should have rang out with praise God, hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. No, we didn't. But we didn't. Do you know why? Because we've forgotten the mighty works of God. We have allowed Satan to shut our mouth. But we ought to have praised him. This roof should have been lifted with hallelujah, praise the Lord. Woo, somebody got saved. But you know what? Because it's not a norm in our life anymore, when someone says that, it's like, oh, yeah, that's good. There's no joy. There's no excitement. There's no, wow, look what God did. He saved a soul. This person, this child was on their way to hell, ready to burn for all eternity in hell. And God saved them from that. Oh, hands should have been raised and people should be clapping and like, glory to God. Do you know why? Because there was joy in the presence of God over one sinner that saved. And if there's joy in the presence of God, which is in heaven, why isn't there joy in the presence of God when he's here in the midst? Help us, Lord. So we ought to be praising. The psalmist is lamenting. He's saying, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works. Oh, how soon we forget. Psalm 139, verse number 14 says this. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Marvelous are thy works. We're to praise him for his works. We're to, to praise him for what he has done. We're to declare them. We're to declare the miraculous, mighty works of God. But we've forgotten them. We're not seeing them. In not too long ago, in a far distant land, in another church, there was a lady that was bedridden for, oh, how many years? 25 years. And when we went to this far-flung land and we were there for a short time and I had said to the husband of this lady and showed him some scriptures and basically said, and I was probably a bit naive, I just thought everyone believed that God can still do it. And so I said to this brother, I said, listen, I want you to show these scriptures to your wife and let them read them. And, and if she's willing to, or James chapter 5, I'd like to come and annoy her with her, but only if you're happy to do that. And I mean, how can people know unless they're instructed and shared with? And so we did that and we went over there and long story short, we anointed the lady with oil and that next Sunday she's in church. She hasn't been in church for 25 years. And that was an exciting thing. People were excited. They were like, wow, uh, sister, you're here. And, and they were like, wow, what's going on? But you know the joy soon died off because every Sunday night we would have blessing time. We would, in the song service, we'd sing a song and that song would stop and just like we did this morning and people would say, has anyone got a blessing? Anyone got a testimony? Well, this lady, for I don't know how long, probably for the next three weeks, month, she would testify of the works that God has done for her as far as her healing works. She would get up and praise God and say, God healed me. God did this. God did that. Do you know that people soon got sick and tired of hearing that? 
Do you know some rumbling started coming because of that? One of them was, she, got, she said one night, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I think immature Christians would think this way, mature Christians wouldn't, but she got up, and I don't know whether you've ever come across this, and she testified, and she just basically said, oh, I just want to thank the pastor for healing me. Now, we know we don't do the healing, and most mature Christians know that. It's like the, it's like the person that gets saved, and they say, oh, Joe Bloggs saved me. Well, Joe Bloggs didn't save you. God did it, but we understand what they're saying. Right, right. So mature Christians understand that. It's the immature ones that don't. Well, the immature Christians started rising up and saying, you should have corrected her. In front. You can't heal anybody, and you can't do this. And oh, do you believe? And my goodness, you would have thought that I'd committed some sort of heresy. But you know what? The marvelous, miraculous, mighty works of God were being praised and declared. And at the start, people were praising too. But in the end, people were like, now we're going to go there in a minute. Pastor Marsh already went there this morning in Numbers chapter 11. How soon did Israel forget about what God was doing in the wilderness, feeding them with manna? And they lusted exceedingly, as we saw in Psalm 106. They lusted exceedingly for the garlics and the leeks and the herbs and all those things back in Egypt. And they wanted to go back there and they forgot the bondage and the badness and all that sort of stuff. Because all they thought about was the leeks and this and that. And they forgot about the works of God. I mean, come on, put yourself in their shoes. I mean, God only made the Red Sea depart and they crossed over it. He not only brought manna and the quail, as we heard this morning, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. God made water come from the flint of a rock. God was doing some mighty, miraculous works and they forgot them. But we do too. Yeah. We do too. John 14, 12. I love this verse. And I remember the first time I heard it preached, Dr. Hiles was preaching from it and And it sort of blew me away a little bit. Jesus said this in John 14, 12. I'm going to quote Jesus. He said this. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works shall he do because I go unto my Father. Now, some theological deadhead probably would say, well, that's just confined to the Gospels. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, he that believeth on me. Can I ask you a question? Have you believed on Jesus? Well, then according to what Jesus said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do. And greater works shall he do, because I'm going unto my Father. Mm -hmm. Wow. You see... Possibly no one is declaring the works of God because they are not allowing God to do the work through them. Because it's not the individual that does the work. And even Jesus said this himself. It's not me that worketh, but the Father which is in me. He doeth the work. Mm -hmm. So even Jesus knew himself that he was subject to the Father and whatever he said and whatever he did came from the Father which was working through him and that same Father is in me and is in you and he wants to do the works through us. Why? So he can be praised and glorified. Oh, I'm not advocating that we go down to the cemetery and try and raise people. I'm not advocating that we go to Nambour or to Kiwana Hospital and walk the halls and try and have people healed. That's foolishness. I don't even believe that the apostles could heal at will. I believe they had to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And it was the Spirit of God that did the works through them. And I agree with what Preacher said this morning. The apostle Paul did do some amazing supernatural things that only he did. I can get that. But can I say to you that the same God that was working through Paul is the same God that works through me and you. Amen. I agree. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do. Oh, forget the greater works. Let's just focus on the works. I'm grateful for his soul winning work. I don't win a soul. I lead them, and Brother Marshall knows, we lead them to Jesus and Jesus saves them. But he wants to do the works through us. 
It's not us that heal the sick. We, out of obedience to the word of God, anoint with the oil, we lay hands on. It's God that does the work so that God gets the glory. It's not us that feeds the homeless and takes care of the poor and all that. It's God working the works through us so that we give him the glory. Amen. Oh, how soon we forget. But the sad thing about this in Psalm 106, let's go back there if you're not there already. As I said, the domino effect that takes place when we forget his works. I don't want to forget what God has done in my life. And our responsibility is to remember, to rehearse it and reinforce it. We should never be ashamed to talk about the miracles of God Almighty. We don't do it as much now, and perhaps we should, but there was a time where our family would sit down and we would talk about the miracle of leaving Adelaide and coming to Brisbane. Because everything that God did was miraculous for us. And we would sit down at the table and we would talk about it. But we still do now about certain things that God did and how God provided and, and what the Lord did. But I don't, want to just re- I don't want to just remember what he did. I want to be reminded of what he can do. Amen. Because when we remember his works and we remember that God is God, as I said before, it ought to encourage us and excite us. And it ought to help us get up in the morning and say, God, I want to yield myself to you. Use me today. And we ought to be, we ought not, listen, when we have testimony time, I think this whole place, this whole room, everyone that's here should testify of the mighty works of God. But perhaps there's no mighty works of God done in our lives because we haven't believed him. We haven't put him to the test, so to speak. We haven't allowed him to work through us. Or perhaps we just don't want to praise God and, because we don't want to speak out. Listen, Satan doesn't want anyone to know about what God can do. But when you look at this domino effect, and in Psalm 106, he says this, verse 13, they soon forget his works, they waited not for his counsel. When you forget his works, you start finding your own way. They waited not for his counsel. They forgot the works of God. They forgot how God led them through the wilderness. They forgot how God told them to go over the Red Sea. I'm going, they, they forgot that God said, do this. And they forgot that God said, smite, smite the rock and water will gush out. They forgot his works and then it said they waited not for his counsel. They took matters into their own hands and instead of waiting for God to give counsel in regards to direction, they said, we're going to find our own way now. We're going to do our own thing. And isn't that sad? It's sad when we forget the works of God and then we say, you know what? Thank you, God, for what you did. I'll take it from here. (laughs) How foolish we can be. In Proverbs chapter 20, in verse number 24, the Bible says this, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? In other words, God is saying, the way that you take, I am the one that gives you that way. Now, if our way comes from God, then he says, how can a man then understand his own way? In other words, how can I find my way through this life apart from God? And the works of God and the ways of God go hand in hand. Because when we submit ourselves to the way of God and we wait for his counsel. Now, let let me just say this. Never do anything if you haven't heard from God. Wait for his counsel. Because when God gives you counsel and he says, do this, do you know what follows or what goes before you? His works. David often went before God when he, came to, when he comes to his enemies and he would say, God, shall we pursue or shall we forbear? Do you remember ever reading that about King David? He would often say, God, shall we pursue or shall... And God would say, pursue. And so David knew that when he would pursue, God would say, because I'm going to give them into your hand. In other words, when David waited for his way, waited for his counsel... David went and the works of God went with him. It could be that 
one reason that we don't see the miracles of God is because we haven't waited for His counsel. Instead of waiting for His counsel and God saying, go and do this, we've just taken it upon ourselves to go and do what we want to do and then expect to God to bless our way. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Lamentations 3.25 says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him to the soul that seeketh Him. That verse was a blessing. Uh, we shared that last Tuesday. Jerome and I were having devotions and I mentioned the verse where it says it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. He said, oh, where is that? So we went to Lamentations and we read that. Well, I read a few verses before and after it and I come across verse number 25. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. And I thought, you know... How amazing is that? When we learn to wait for God, God is good to us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, absolutely. When we wait for Him, the Lord is good to them that, and, and those that seek Him. It's, it's those of us that have an... And I'm saying us because I'm putting myself here. It's those of us that have an impatient spirit that we run ahead of God and we get into trouble and then we say, oh, God, help us. And because of his graciousness, he does. But I'd rather not get into trouble and have to ask God to bail me out. I've done it too many times. But if we learn to wait for him, he's good to them to wait for him. When God gives you his direction, his works will follow. Secondly, I want you to notice verse number 14. It says this, and it's all connected here. They waited not for his counsel, but, that's a conjunction, lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And here's the second thought. When God's works are soon forgotten, spiritual drift begins. I want you to hold your place there, and I want you to go to Numbers chapter 11, please. Numbers chapter 11. And we're not going to take time to read all of what took place because it's just, it's very lengthy. But in Numbers chapter 11, where this phrase is taken from, where it says, but they lusted exceedingly, goes back to here. And we made mention of it, Brother Mars did this morning, and I did just a minute ago. In Numbers chapter 11, look at verse number 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. They're not too bad when you juice them, by the way. <laughs> but now my, our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. My goodness, they are complaining about God's provision. <coughs> Verse number seven. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof is the color of bellion. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. Now look at this. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. That's a message in all of itself because fresh oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. They were we could say this. They were experiencing a move of the Spirit of God amongst them. But you know what happened? They forgot the works and remembered the leeks and the garlics. And they complained about, oh, we've got no flesh. And you know what God did? God did send the quail. And you know what happened? They picked the quail up and as soon as they chomped down onto it, it went bad. And they vomited and spewed and all sorts. Now... They lusted exceedingly and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Brother Marsh brought this out this morning that Egypt is a type of the world. And when we start forgetting the works of God, spiritual drift sets in. That's right. So in other words, remembering the works of God and relying upon the works of God keeps us straight when it comes to our spiritual lives. Dr. Hiles said this, he said, when motion ends, drift begins. The moment we stop, drift begins. Have you ever been in a boat fishing and the anchor hasn't been thrown out and you have thrown the line out and they do it sometimes intentionally because they want to they just want to go with the tide they want to go with the flow and wherever the river's going or the water's going that's the way the boat's going sometimes christians are like that motion stops they stop in their life and instead of throwing the anchor out and being grounded and riveted to where they are they just go with the flow mm -hmm. 
And they go wherever the river wants to take them. And here in Numbers 11, it was the mixed multitude that fell a lusting. And I want to just say this. We have to be careful who we hang out with. Because if we hang out with the wrong kind of people, they rub off on us. That's right. You would think that we would rub off on them, but it's not the case. You never see that in the Bible. You always see the wrong crowd affecting the right crowd in a negative way. And so they started drifting. We want to go back to the world. We want to go back to the world. I'm not going to re-preach the message this morning, but it, Brother Marsh quoted 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And all. It's not of God. Do you know when churches or when pastors forget the works of God, their churches end up in spiritual drift? Mm -hmm. And they start relying on man's methodology instead of God's miraculous works. We don't want to go down that path. No. It, you know, to be honest with you, and it's hard to say this because we want to see the church grow, but if, if we just stayed at the size that we were... But we remembered the works of God and we didn't want to have spiritual drift. And we didn't want to go the same way that most churches are going. And the sacrifice of that was remaining small. Are we prepared for that? We say that now. But we have to be careful. Because the moment we stop remembering the works of God... We stop praying about God still doing those works. And when we stop praying and asking God to do the miraculous, we start supplementing that with our own ideas. Well, let's do it this way. Let's, let's forget the door knocking and let's just letterbox. Now, I'm not against the, I'm not against the letterboxing. I, you know, it has its place. But I said to Brother Marsh on I can't, Wednesday, was it? I think it was Wednesday when we door knocked Katie. I said to Brother Marsh, I said, if we never door knocked, we would not have come across this family. That's right. If we hadn't a door knocked, we wouldn't have come across Adam and Danielle. If we didn't door knock, we wouldn't have come across John and Marilyn. And do you know that we're starting, and preachers already said, we're starting to see more people come through door knocking than what we've done through letterboxing now. Let's not forget that. But God did that. God worked through us. Yes, our legs moved and our hands knocked and we just shared the wonderful works of God about salvation and invited people to come to church. We were part of that, but God always gets the glory because Amen. God brought them along. Amen. So spiritual drift begins. They wanted to go back to the world. How do we stop doing that? Well, I want you to have a look very quickly at Psalm 143. Psalm 143. I have really enjoyed reading through the book of Psalms. In Psalm 143, look at verse 5 and 6. How are we going to not forget the works of God? By doing what the psalmist David did. Verse 5, I remember the days of old. Look at this. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Selah. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying, when I meditate and muse, which is to mull over and chew and, and just dwell on it, when I meditate and dwell on the works of God, on the, the things of old, it creates a thirst in me. Do you know why we have apathy today? Do you know why perhaps we don't have as many people on a Sunday night that could be here that are not here? Because they're not meditating on the works of God. They're not musing on it. They're not dwelling on the miraculous mighty power of God. And because of that, the thirst is not being generated. Well, I haven't got any works to speak of. God hasn't done anything in my life lately. Okay, but you have a book full of the miraculous. Amen. You have a book here that we could meditate on. And he says this, when I'm using and meditating, I'm stretching my hands under <coughs> in my prayer. I, I've got my hands under the Lord and I'm looking up and I say, oh, God, do it again. Amen. Do, it again. do it again. Do it again. My soul thirsteth after thee as a, dry, a thirsty land. It's like, man, I am parched. I want more of it. That's what he's saying. 
So when God's works are soon forgotten, spiritual drift sets in. Lastly, let's have a look at this now in verse number 15. Psalm 106, 15. And conjunction. Do you see the downward spiral? I've forgotten his works. That means now that I've forgotten the works of God, I've now started going my own way and I've now started going into spiritual drift. But look at this. He says, he gave them their request. And again, we're not going to take the time, but back in Numbers, you could read it. It's a good, it's a good story. It's a good account. They lusted exceedingly. They, they wanted the quail. They wanted this. And God gave them their request. Now look at this. But sent leanness into their soul. When God's works are forgotten, weakness sets in. He sent leanness. They sacrificed their spiritual strength. In other words, they got what they wanted, but at a cost. You see, God wants, God wants to do it his way. God doesn't want us lusting after the wrong thing. Now, you better be careful what you ask for. Better be careful what you ask for. I remember years ago, do you remember at Sunshine, Peter and Glenda's son, Bern? I remember his family came one night, we had a, a supper after, and he was talking to me about going into the mines and working in the mines, and he was saying about a place that he wanted to go. And I said, brother, I said, do they have a church out there? No. I said, but you're going to sacrifice your spiritual life and your family's spiritual life for dollars and cents? What a cost. What a cost. I think it would be better for us to have spiritual gratification than physical gratification. Yeah, sure. We were sharing during the week, Brother Marsh and I, about men of God that were once being mightily used within our movement, but for self or physical gratification, they're no longer being used of God anymore. They sacrificed, they sold their birthright just for some pleasure. God said, all right, I'm going to give you what you asked for, but I'm going to send leanness to your soul. You're going to be weak spiritually. You're going to struggle spiritually. You're going to have a hard time spiritually. Now, I believe you can come out of that. But there's always a cost. You never come out of sacrificing the spiritual for the physical without it affecting you. And this is exactly where they are at. Now think about it. They soon forget his works. They forgot. Think about that. They forgot what God did. They forgot what God was able to do. And because of that, they didn't wait for his counsel, but took upon themselves and said, you know what, we're going to go our own way now. They didn't wait for that. They were finding their own way. They ended up in spiritual drift and then they had spiritual weakness set in. King David said this. Can I share one last scripture? Have a look at Psalm 142. King David. Now, Lots can be said about King David. When King David committed his sin with Bathsheba, things were never the same again. And when you read the Psalms, you, you read a king pleading. And king David said this in Psalm 142, verse number... Oh, sorry, Psalm 143, verse 4. 
Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. My heart within me is desolate. In another place of scripture, and I can't find it, he said, my soul is destitute. That's a, that is a very uncomfortable place to be in. Now, I believe that the reason why he's lamenting that is because David made some choices in his life that weren't good choices and the cost was high. We don't want to sacrifice physical pleasure for spiritual strength. We don't want the leanness sent into our soul. So how are we going to do that? It is imperative that we remember, rehearse and reinforce the works of God in our life. Far called, our navies melt away. On dune and headland sink the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one like with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge the nations, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. If drunk with the sight of power, we lose wild tongues that have not thee in awe, such boasting as the Gentiles use, or lesser breeds without the law, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget, lest we forget the works of God. Let's not forget the works of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. We ask that you would help us to not forget and you know if the children of Israel forgot we can forget but God help us not to help us to remember help us to rehearse help us to believe you God we want to do the works that Jesus did we want to do the greater works not for our own pleasure not for our own praise but so that we could heap praise and glory upon you Father God, I pray that as adults that we would be mindful to rehearse into the years of the next generation the works of Almighty God. Oh Lord, we want a generation coming up behind us that hope in God because you are a mighty, miraculous God. So Lord, I pray that this week, and we don't know what the week holds, But I pray that you would be pleased to use us to work through us those wonderful works. And we'll be mindful to give you the praise and all the thanks. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.